Good morning. Good morning. Welcome in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is good to be back with you today to be a part of your worship service, to come into God's presence and enjoy his love and his care. You know, it's a beautiful day of creation out there. One of the things during this time of year that I try to pay attention to is if there's anything still in the field. And coming up here on the Alpha Road and along Interstate 80, and, or 90, I'm sorry, and, and then up here, I didn't see any crops out there. So I, I imagine this means that for those of you who are farmers or who are in, engaged in farming, it's a big relief. And I hope also a big thank you to God for his faithfulness to you. Because God's word of promise is that as long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest. And you know what? Every year since he made that promise, there has been seed time and there has been harvest. God is faithful. And if he's faithful in that, he's also faithful in his greater promise of our salvation through faith in Jesus. And it's interesting to note, I was looking at your baptismal font, and this is one of those fonts that has eight sides, if I counted right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, yeah. Any of you know why that baptismal font has eight sides on it? Well, I can give you any answer then, right? <laughs> well, the reason it has eight sides on it is because when a person is baptized, that person, as, w as when I was here the last time, is baptized into Christ's death, and as Christ was raised from the dead, the one who is baptized is also raised to new life in Christ. He or she becomes a new creation. And Jesus was raised on a Sunday. Now, let's, let's go back to the days of creation. The first day of creation was a Sunday. The last day of creation was Saturday. That's seven days. On the eighth day, Jesus is raised from the dead as a new creation. And so when one is baptized, they too, through Christ, are raised from death to a, be a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. So your baptismal font, the, it's, the way it is designed and built, gives evidence of the faithfulness of God to his greater promise. And that is of new life through faith in Jesus. What a God we have. So let's celebrate him this day as we join in our opening hymn.
Please stand. Our service this morning is the service of prayer and preaching, beginning on page 260. 260. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and From the rising of the sun to its setting. The name of the Lord is grace. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Sanctify us in your truth. From the rising of the sun to its setting. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading for our worship this morning, the 24th Sunday after Pentecost, is from the fifth chapter of Amos. Now this is kind of a weird statement, Amos says. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Now, shouldn't we all desire the day of the Lord? For the day of the Lord is the day when Christ returns. Alleluia, amen, I'm looking forward to that. But why does he say woe to you who desire the day of the Lord? The answer is simple. Those to whom he is writing, the people of the northern kingdom of Samaria, of Israel, they were living a life of hypocrisy. They were going up and sin in a storm and then coming before the Lord as if everything was all right and they didn't need to repent. You see, they didn't really want the day of the Lord, but yet they made it as if they did. They were too interested in making money and living the high life, oppressing the poor, living a life of sin, but yet playing the game of being the people of God. And to those people, and if there's any of those people here today, woe to you, woe to them. 
until God brings you to repentance. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light, as if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall, and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light, and gloom with no solemn assemblies? I hate, I despise your feasts, says the Lord, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. This is the word of the Lord. A reading from 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. The Apostle Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that is, dead, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with a voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the gospel reading. A reading from Matthew, the 25th chapter. This is a parable that Jesus spoke after he spoke after he told his apostles about the things coming at the end including his return and now with this parable he's trying to explain a little bit more how we are to respond to all of these things Jesus said then the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom five of them were foolish and five were wise For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. This is the word of the Lord. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. At this time in in this particular service, we go back to our catechism as we reflect upon the words of God 
in the Ten Commandments and as it is expressed through the Apostles' Creed and in the Lord's Prayer. Now, one of the interesting things about the Ten Commandments found both in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5 is that the commandments themselves are preceded by these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And so when you think about what God is saying, then it makes sense in terms of his commandments. Since God has delivered them, set them free from slavery, and, and save them from that, it makes a whole lot of sense to have no other gods, right? Why should we misuse the name of the Lord your God? Why should we take his name in vain? And so let us think about these commandments as we speak them in light of the deliverance God has given us today in Christ, for he too has delivered us from the slavery of sin and death and the devil. So we share in the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now next is the Apostles' Creed. And as you know, the Apostles' Creed is not found in the Bible, but it is very biblical in the sense that what it says about God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is taken from the Bible and put together in a very concise way for us to express. And so it is a good thing for us to know and to share, not only in our studies, but also in our worship as we affirm to one another what it is that we believe. And so we express our faith then through these words. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And finally, the Lord's Prayer. This is biblical, and it is in the Bible. We find it in Matthew chapter 6 as part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and then again in Luke chapter 11, where it is presented as an, in an abbreviated form. Now, prayer is simply talking with God and living in a relationship with him through faith in Jesus. And Jesus taught us this prayer, and it is interesting in this prayer that it is full of petitions. It's full of things that we ask of God, and if you recall what Luther said about prayer, if our prayers have no petitions, then are we really praying? Because God wants us to ask him as dear children ask their dear father. And so let us stand and not just recite this, but let us pray. Please stand. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for our next hymn. Thank you.
Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace this day from God our Father and our Lord Jesus. Our text this morning comes from the second lesson, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 18. There, Paul ends this section of his letter with these words. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So far, the text. And our theme taken from the text is encourage one another. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, I pray that you would settle our hearts and our minds so that we can be focused upon you as you come to us through your word. Guide me in my thoughts and my tongue so that the word I speak is your word, clearly and effectively, so that you, O Holy Spirit, can do your sanctifying work in the lives of all of us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Remember the old song, Home on the Range? Home, on, home, home on the range where the deer and the antelope play, where seldom is heard a discouraging word and the skies are not cloudy all day. Beautiful words there, aren't they? Where seldom is heard a discouraging word and the skies are not cloudy all day. I like those words. Maybe this raises to you or in you the desire to go back to those good old days when there were, was hardly a discouraging word and the skies were not cloudy all day. If that's how you lived your life, tell me, because I didn't live my life that way. I wasn't in your world if that's where you were. For you see, my life has been full of discouraging words and cloudy days because I, as a saint and sinner, live in a fallen world. So, when Paul tells us, therefore encourage one another with these words, it kind of, ding, I'd like to find out more about that. Would you? Well, I hope so, because that's what we're going to talk about this morning. If not, well, maybe next week. It'll be your week. Who knows? But, but let's think in terms of what Paul is saying. Encourage one, of the, one another with these words. Well, what are those words he is speaking about? Well, in the epistle lesson, 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul tells us that they are the Lord's words. We read, for example, in verse 15, This we declare to you by a word from the Lord. Now, before we start thinking about these words from the Lord that are encouraging, Let's first think about discouraging words. And I'm sure you can come up with all kinds of discouraging words you have heard and you have spoken. But one of those discouraging words that comes right to the top is a lie. Lies are very discouraging. And think back with me to the Old Testament, to the book of Genesis, and to a fellow by the name of Joseph, the 11th son of Jacob. You know the story. Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers because they were jealous of him. And then things went from bad to worse when he got thrown into prison. And then in prison, he was given the privilege by the, the jailer to kind of take care of things because Joseph was capable and his capability came from God. So one day there were two guys who were pretty much down in the dumps and so Joseph went and said, what's going on? Well, we had dreams last night, and they trouble us. Well, tell me the dreams, and maybe I can interpret them. Well, Joseph, they told him the dream. The first guy's dream, Joseph interpreted thusly. Well, this dream means that in three days, you will be released and be reinstated to your position as cupbearer to the pharaoh. Well, that sounded pretty good to the second guy. He said, okay, can you interpret my dream? Well, tell me. Well, he told him the dream, and he said, well, in three days, you're going to be executed. Well, it happened just as Joseph said for both of those guys. Well, to the one who was going to be released, or was released, Joseph said as he was leaving, uh, remember me to Pharaoh. And the guy turns around and says, yeah, I will. Lie. He got released, he got back in his position, and he forgot all about Joseph. And there was Joseph just lingering in prison until Pharaoh had a dream one day. 
Now you have to believe that when day after day Joseph was still in prison and that guy was out serving the Pharaoh, he was quite discouraged because a lie can be a very, very discouraging word. And so this brings us to God because you see God speaks to us a lot. He gives us a lot of words and promises, doesn't he? And they're all in the Bible. You just open it and there's God's words right there. So the question that we have to deal with is this. Are the words of God, the promises of God, faithful and true? Or are they not? And a lot hangs in the balance on how you answer that question. And what hangs in the balance that's most important for you and for me is our very salvation. Because if God is not faithful and true to his word, then how can we trust in what he promises for us regarding our salvation? So, how do we answer that question? Are God's words and promises true, or are they not? Well, the Apostle Paul gives an answer in his letter to Titus, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. There he wrote, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. Did you get that? Paul tells us that God never lies. This means every word in this book is true, and you can count on it. Now, I know in the world we live, not only today, but going all the way back to the beginning, when Satan asked Eve that question, did God really say that? God really doesn't mean that, does he? And he planted in her mind the doubt as to the truth of God's word. And we've been doubting it ever since. But you know, the truth of God's word does not depend upon whether you or I or anyone believes it to be true. Any more than 2 plus 2 equals 4. You might believe it equals 0, 10, 125. And you put that down on your test paper and you're going to get it checked and you're going to funk flunk the the test. There are truths that are truth that are true regardless of whether or not people believe them. And so it is with God's word because he does not lie. He does not lie because he cannot lie because there's no sin in him. And so he is truthful and this means that all of his promises even about our salvation can be counted on. Now, I don't know about you, but I find this to be very encouraging. And to kind of back up what Paul said here in Titus, he would write also in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20, that all the promises of God find their yes in Christ Jesus. All the promises of God find their yes in Christ Jesus. And who is Christ Jesus? He is God and man in one person. And this is why we can be encouraged by God's word and in turn encourage one another with his words because they are always, always true. That's hard for us to get our minds around because as fallen sinful human beings, Our words are not always true, nor are the words of our neighbor. So who can be trusted? God can. God can. So encourage one another with these words. Now, what words are these that in our text, Paul says, encourage one another? Well, we have to go back just a little bit. The people in Thessalonica needed an encouraging word, 
in regard to those who died before Jesus had returned. You see, they were so pumped up about Jesus' return from heaven that they believed he would return before they died. But some had already died, and Jesus had yet to return. So they were troubled. What, what's going to happen to, to them? Are they lost? Are they going to become some kind of second-class citizens in the kingdom? Will they not be able to experience the joy of Jesus' return? What's going on? So they were troubled. And to this troubling concern, Paul responds in verses 13 and 14. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that is, dead, that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Let's think through this for just a minute. First of all, Paul is telling us that no matter who it is who dies, whether it's one who believed in Jesus Christ or not, death is tough on those who are left behind. And many, many here know that so well because you have lost loved ones to death. But who are these whom Paul talks about who have no hope? They're the ones who grieve for people who died apart from faith in Jesus. For those who die apart from faith in Jesus die apart from the promise of God of eternal life in Christ. So instead of heaven being their home, hell will be their eternal abode. And what hope there is there. Dante wrote in his Divine Comedy in part one or book one, he said that, Above the gate going into hell is this sign, Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. And so, what Paul is telling us and telling them is that the encouraging word of God is that those who die in faith in Christ, they have a hope a heavenly hope. Now, how is this going to be played out? Well, we read in verse 14 again, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. So the promise is that those who have died, their souls or spirits will be with the Lord, their bodies will have been buried, And when Jesus returns, those who have died, their souls and spirits will return with the Lord to inhabit their bodies, which will be raised again to glorified bodies, Paul tells us in Philippians 3, like their Lord's. So these folks are not lost. These folks won't be second-class citizens in the kingdom of heaven. These folks won't miss out on the joy and excitement of Jesus' return and all it means. Encourage one another with these words he is saying. Now, let's think this through from another illustration in Scripture. This time in the New Testament, Jesus is being crucified. On either side, as it's described in the Gospel, are two thieves. And To cut to the chase, one of the thieves turns to Jesus as he is dying and says, remember me in your kingdom when you return. Or just, I'm sorry, remember me in your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. And and, and so what Jesus is dealing with or telling us here is what I've shared earlier, that when one who trusts in Jesus as their Savior dies, 
their soul when it leaves the body, which is the time of death, goes to be with the Lord. Now, this, this thief who asked Jesus to remember him, he, like Jesus, died on that cross. He, like Jesus, had his body taken down from that cross. But unlike Jesus' body, which was buried, this guy's body was most likely thrown on the garbage heap to become dog food for the wild dogs and for the vultures that were flying around. Not very well treated, you might say. But nonetheless, Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Your body's there, a, a mass of tissue and bone on the garbage heap, but your soul is in heaven. And when I return, though he didn't say it to the thief, but scripture tells us, when I return, you will come with me and your body will be raised and body and soul, you will be together with me in heaven forever. So these people who were worried and concerned about their relatives and friends who died before Jesus returned, Paul is telling them that the Lord is, is saying to you, you don't need to die, you don't, you don't need to worry. Those who have died before the Lord's return will indeed be in heaven. They won't be second-class citizens. They'll be in the midst of everything that's going on when Jesus returns. And if that weren't enough to encourage them, he went on to say in verse 17, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. They won't be separated from those who have died before the Lord's return any more than you or I. We will be caught up into the air to be with the Lord forever. Encourage one another with these words. Even as you grieve those who have gone before you in death. That's the hope of the gospel. And so, if you've heard any discouraging words lately, Open your Bibles. Read the Gospels. Be encouraged by the truth of God's words and promises to you in and through Christ Jesus. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passeth all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. At this time, we have the opportunity to respond to God's love for us by the giving of our tithes and offerings. The prayer of the church this morning is found on page 265 in your hymnal. It is responsive prayer, and I will conclude each petition with the words, let us pray to the Lord, and I ask you to respond, Lord, have mercy. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the gift of divine peace and of pardon with all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord. For the holy Christian church here and scattered throughout the world, and for the proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord. For this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. For seasonable weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, 
and for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. For all those in need, for the hungry and homeless, for the widowed and orphaned, and for all those in jail and in prison, let us pray to the Lord. For the sick and dying and those who have who mourn the death of loved ones, including we pray for Thelma Socek, mother of Amy Altman, who is hospitalized, for Darcy Fallen, granddaughter of Bruce and Jan Bacalyar, who was undergoing surgery, for Fred Henning on the death of his brother, Arnie. Let us pray to the Lord. For the process here at Emmanuel, that in all things God's will be done as you continue to seek a pastor, let us pray to the Lord. Finally, for these and all our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Lord God, Heavenly Father, send forth your Son to lead home his bride, the church, that with all the company of the redeemed we may finally enter into his eternal wedding feast. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. <clears throat> we pray this day, <clears throat> excuse me, for the nations and peoples of the earth, be it in Yemen, Darfur, Ukraine, Israel, who suffer the horror of war in any form or degree. For those who fight, who must kill and be killed, show your eternal compassion and bring your healing grace and peace. May your chosen people, those called to a living faith in Christ, demonstrate our Savior's concern and forgiving love for the civilians and bystanders, for children and women, for the aged and infirm, for all humanity who are wounded or maimed or who mourn the deaths of loved ones, who suffer the indignities of pain, of looting, of rape, of imprisonment, of enemy occupation, for those who have lost their sanity and ability to be human, even, Lord, for those who have lost their faith in you through their suffering, have mercy on them all and remind them that you can bind up all wounds and heal all the divisions and hurts of men. Bring peace, both temporal and spiritual, O Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we join in Luther's morning prayer. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all doings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen.
Let us bless the Lord. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Please be seated for the closing hymn.
What a joy it is to be with you guys today, to worship God and to experience his blessings and the faithfulness of his word. Uh, is there someone from Martin Luther here today? No. Uh, you do have in your bulletins uh, this very well put together brochure, and I'm sure that you will learn as much from this as you would from a speaker, but it's unfortunate that you don't have them today, but maybe later they will be here. Uh, is there anything else to share for the good of the cause? Now, is there Bible study today? Yes. Oh, good, good. And so everybody's invited to go down and to enjoy some coffee and whatever else is there. And if you like to stay for the Bible study, I, I, I stayed too last month and I enjoyed it very much. And so I encourage all of you to, to stay and to get the fullness of the opportunity of this morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? You had your own special pew, huh? 